Okay, let's make a start. Um, welcome, everybody, to the first uh, Bartlett School of Planning uh, public lecture in our series for the academic year 2020-2021. Um, the format this year will be a little different to previous years uh, for reasons that I'm sure everybody is, is aware of. Um, all our lectures will be online. My name is Nick Gallant, uh, and I'm Professor of Housing and Planning here at UCL, and I'm going to chair uh, this afternoon's event. So every year at BSP, uh, we hold a public lecture series, and these lectures are intended to bring leading international thinkers and practitioners on, on topics related to planning and the built environment before an audience of colleagues, uh, students and guests. In addition to today's lecture, the program for the rest of the year will include uh, Dr. Desiree Fields from the University of California at Berkeley, speaking on racialized geographies of housing financialization. Maria uh, Adebowali uh, Schwartz from the Foundation for Future London, uh, speaking on a topic linked to London uh, and to placemaking, but the title is yet to be confirmed. Then we will have uh, uh, in the new year, Professor Libby Porter from uh, uh, RMIT uh, in Melbourne, uh, speaking on the precarities of dwelling in the settler colonial city. And then finally, uh, Professor Anne Forsyth from Harvard University will give uh, this year's uh, Sir Peter Hall lecture on healthy cities uh, after COVID. Please look at our website for details of the program and we hope to see you at future events. It's been our custom uh, on these occasions to offer you some hospitality, usually made available uh, in the South Cloisters of the Wilkins Building once the lecture and discussion is concluded. As we all know, we're all sitting at home so we can guess this. This is not going to be possible this year, but I hope that we will be able to get together uh, and reflect on this year's program uh, at future events. Let me now introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Professor Rebecca Chu was until very recently head of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at the University of Hong Kong, where she remains a professor and director of the Center for Urban Studies and Urban Planning. She's also, she also leads her faculty's Belt and Road Urban Observatory. Rebecca's research has focused for a number of years on housing, uh, uh, and her current work uh, on housing addresses healthy aging and the contribution good planning and design can make to helping people lead active and healthy lives into later life. More broadly, uh, Rebecca was also the founding chairman of the Asia Pacific Network for Housing Research. And today she spends much of her time advising the Hong Kong government on a range of matters from housing through land, planning, urban renewal, and the conservation uh, of natural and, and heritage assets. The title of her talk today uh, reflects very much her ongoing uh, research and current interests, and that title is Urbanism and Older People's uh, Mental Wellbeing. I'm sure you will want to ask uh, Rebecca questions, um, and you can do so by uh, typing in questions into the Q&A uh, uh, box uh, on screen. Uh, I can then either ask those questions directly to Rebecca at the end, or if you'd prefer to ask a question directly yourself, uh, you can raise your hand and we can uh, unmute you. So without further ado, uh, uh, Rebecca, welcome uh, to UCL uh, virtually and to the Bartlett School of Planning, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, this, in fact, is the second time that Nick invited me, but it's my first presentation, and uh, the first one, due to some an, an accident before I gave the lecture, so that has to be cancelled. So I'm really uh, grateful that uh, Nick uh, invites me again, and uh, hopefully after three, three years, the uh, what I can present today is better than what I could have done uh, three years ago. So um, today is uh, the topic on urbanism and old people's uh, mental well-being, and I like to put uh, Hong Kong as the subject for reflection because of its uh, quite um, well, in a way, extreme um, urban landscape. 
Uh, but um, uh, what, what actually what I really like to see is uh, as a, a very compact city, uh, what are the opportunities and constraints that Hong Kong can offer to the mental well-being of its elderly uh, inhabitants? And uh, in this presentation, I particularly want to focus on the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the key issues that I like to look at, I like to start with the uh, conceptual context by uh, citing uh, two pieces of uh, literature uh, on the, the living environment and um, the impact on uh, cognitive function. And after that, of course, is the empirical context of Hong Kong, looking at this aging plans, urban form and uh, vertical living. And, uh, and, but the um, main part of the presentation is I want to uh, share with you my uh, three studies, I mean, together, of course, with the team, uh, three studies uh, on, the, um, uh, on, on the built environment and the um, elderly people or housing issues in an aging community. Uh, but the focus is really on neighborhood planning and design. Uh, looking at its impact on mental well-being, and uh, particularly in the dimension of uh, social, psychological, and cognitive function or conditions, uh, because elderly, of course, uh, what is most important to them, from my, uh, in my view, is uh, really the neighborhood planning, where they are so known to be the uh, block or neighborhood drivers, and I'll try to draw some conclusions from there. So uh, on, on the uh, kind of conceptual background, um, as I said, I'd like to uh, quote two references, uh, both actually are uh, led by Philippa Clark. And um, they, what they have presented, uh, I mean the paper presented about the kind of built environment which are conducive to cognitive preserve and in fact are very similar to what Hong Kong can offer. So I don't choose them because they, you know, they, uh, they seem to um, be positive about the kind of a uh, neighbor environment that Hong Kong can offer, but rather I, I would like to use their conceptual arguments to actually reflect on Hong Kong, whether we can really achieve those which are supposedly whether we should be able to achieve, given the nature or the attributes of our, of our uh, built environment. Now, uh, in, the, in the paper, um, Clark argues that um, neighborhood resources, they are very important for promoting cognitive uh, research for the uh, elderly adults. And they point out that affluent neighborhoods will have a net positive effect on cognitive function. So, so what does that mean I mean, by um, affluent neighborhood? What they mean is really the greater density of institutional resources, which can um, serve the elderly, uh, in terms of uh, promoting uh, the physical activities. And uh, the more active they are, uh, well, that, that, uh, the, uh, the cognitive um, uh, functions should be able to retain better. Uh, but I find it very interesting that they, they said actually that in, the, in a stable residence in an elderly neighborhood, say for example, uh, a retirement village, uh, in the first few years actually, uh, the, the cognitive function seems to be performing well. But after a while, after two or three years, maybe they got used to it. They know one another very well. But yet, uh, in a stable residence environment, then there's lack of uh, stimulation. So when they are exposed to this kind of environment for a longer term, then it seems that um, it has a negative effect on, on their um, cognitive function. function. So in that then, um, that may imply that the more stimulating environment will be better for the men mental well-being of the elderly. And, um, and then and accessibility is important, so public transit and public spaces, of course, that offers a place for uh, socialization, but this space has got to be in good condition in order to have better um, cognitive uh, uh, I mean, better co cognitive uh, impacts. Um, so, because the better quality, then you know, and, and they uh, uh, can uh, can perform more social and physical activities, and uh, easier to move about to get to the place that they want, particularly for community facilities. 
And uh, in contrast, of course, when public spaces, they're not in good condition and poor condition, then uh, will be less uh, people would use it and therefore it would have a negative impact on cognitive function. So what, what that means is that the environment, of course, uh, barrier free uh, walkability, a uh, higher walkability is important uh, because then of course they can support uh, uh, more physical, social and leisure activities. Um, now, but, but in this study, they found that the statistical association between barrier-free walkways and um, mental health, um, the association is not very strong. But I do buy the idea that yes, the um, statistical association is not very significant, but it is easier to change the built environment than to ask the elderly to change their behavior. So that means still, you know, a, a more supportive environment will still be uh, overall would uh, generate a benefit to the elderly. So, um, uh, well, intelligent design or community, uh, intelligent, what, what, what that actually means. Uh, I, well, that's what I would like to explore with you uh, for the rest of the lecture. So my research question here is, uh, Hong Kong's urbanism, right, as I said before, it seems to fit well with the uh, built environment requirements as stated in uh, uh, Clark's papers. But do the arguments really applicable to Hong Kong? And if so, how? So this is what I'd like to explore with you in the rest of the uh, um, and, and then I also like to uh, introduce one, one framework uh, which in fact is coming from my research on um, a socially sustainable housing environment. And, and with that uh, framework here, which emphasizes on uh, safety, uh, social cohesion, uh, community facilities, superior access to public facilities and services, and connectivity with the neighboring areas. Now, these are supposed to be uh, attributes of a, a socially sustainable um, living environment. But equally, I find that they also apply to healthy and active aging. And, and so in a way, socially sustainable neighborhoods should be able to, uh, uh, to, to enable the elderly residents to uh, have a slower rate of a cognitive decline. So, so it's applying this that I'm, uh, I'm looking into some of the uh, housing um, outcomes uh, in Hong Kong. So with, then, uh, with the conceptual kind of background, then we could sort of move on to the, the actual uh, situation of Hong Kong. And I'd like to show, uh, first of all, by, uh, the uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. Now, in, in such a very compact built environment, if we look at the occurrence of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's in fact quite equivalent to what UK uh, has, um, has, has, has shown. Um, but I think both Hong Kong and UK perform better than the US. Now, but of course, Hong Kong is just a city and UK and US is a country and it's not only the uh, the urban environment, it also includes the rural environment. So this is just a very crude uh, comparison to show that um, Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong Kong's, uh, in terms of the uh, mental well-being, uh, comparable to countries or cities with lower density, and particularly, I think, in the case of the US. So let's bear this in mind, and we may come back to this later. So uh, just very quickly, I, I believe most of you know what's aging in place and, and that's what talk, uh, a very important pillar of Hong Kong's elderly uh, policy. But our aging in place uh, is mainly by the means of family care. Uh, community support services, uh, 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 yes, it is important, but actual uh, delivery of care and services to uh, elderly, uh, elderly people's private homes is not quite uh, common uh, in Hong Kong. So I think in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but I think um, most of you would know this concept of aging in place. And then the continuum of care. Um, 
the emphasis in Hong Kong, I say, the, uh, the capable, uh, we should facilitate them to lead an active and healthy life and uh, give, provide them with community support services uh, and encourage them to join in the community life. But I think most important is um, encourage them to uh, help the more senior people who are less capable uh, because then they give them a kind of the meaning of life and then of, uh, and, and that kind of uh, being useful, I think is very important for for the uh, mental well-being of the uh, younger elder, the, the, well, the younger olds. And for the less capable, um, they will rely on home-based and center-based community care services, and uh, even to public hospitals, depending on uh, uh, their um, um, functional uh, ability, I mean, the, the, the level of this ability there. And uh, aging uh, in Hong Kong is actually a serious quest, uh, question. So you can see that in the year 2011, the, um, the biggest age groups are in the range of uh, 45 to about 59. But the projection is uh, by uh, 2041, then that, that will be uh, actually the, uh, a very big um, a group of uh, old age cohorts uh, in Hong Kong, and, and it dominates. Um, so the, uh, in terms of actual figure, uh, year 2016, uh, about 16%, uh, over 65 years old, but um, 16 years uh, by, from now, then uh, it will be 29%, and uh, the year 2046 will be 32%. So, so this is uh, alarming, in fact. I think it is uh, the case in, uh, I think, many of, many of the countries uh, globally. Um, and that then, from the housing perspective, of course, that will generate uh, a huge demand for elderly-friendly housing or uh, an age-friendly uh, living environment. And I think more to note is that um, as the um, society has become more and more affluent, more and more people being educated, then the elderly cohort will become more diverse and in some ways uh, more demanding on the, what to them are um, elderly friendly housing or age friendly living environment. So, so I think it's a real uh, challenge to the government and of course now we're paying more and more attention to this. Now on the um, urbanism of Hong Kong, uh, I think that this map shows quite well that actually the natural topography of Hong Kong um, does affect um, much of the, um, um, the, the, the urban landscape of Hong Kong. And um, this is the Victoria Harbor here, and uh, this is the main urban area and where the old districts are. And then we have nine new towns which are in different pockets of the, uh, what we call the Northern, uh, the, the New Territory, and uh, mostly uh, coastal, where land is more um, sort of uh, level. And Hong Kong's terrain is very hilly, 78% uh, uh, with slopes like, like this. Uh, and uh, over the years, we have built up um, a very, quite a good um, sort of transport network, linking up all the new towns with the main urban area by uh, railway. So, so traveling is easy in Hong Kong. And then in terms of our housing form, um, mostly about 70%, I would say, are in the form of housing estates, um, and, um, particularly in the public housing sector, the public rental housing and subsidized uh, owner occupier housing. And in some ways, it, it is good because of the housing estate, then there are more facilities, uh, community facilities would be provided. And I'll uh, show you more about the, uh, the details of this. So uh, the three studies I, I did, one is the uh, citywide study. Uh, so a uh, questionnaire survey of 500, uh, 5,000 5, samples from the younger to the, to the older, because we also look at the relationship between the young people and, and the elderly uh, people. Uh, we did those uh, interviews, focus group uh, discussion and, and, and secondary, uh, of course, data that we collected as well. Um, no, um, okay, so um, the, 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 uh, what I'd like to share with you, uh, well, this, this is a very big, big study, but what I want to share with you today uh, is a question about does the neighbor environment facilitate 
active aging in Hong Kong, leading to better uh, mental well-being. And then my second study is looking at different types of housing estates. Some are greater communities, some are semi-gated, some are fully open, some are partially open. So uh, about 900 uh, uh, interviews uh, I did. Uh, it's all over Hong Kong and uh, different uh, housing estates of different ages too. And this is, uh, this could be quite daunting, I, I believe to most of you, uh, the kind of density um, that we have in Hong Kong. And these are the examples of housing estates. And the top two, uh, they are public housing estates. So facilities here, uh, including public uh, transport uh, tran uh, station. And then uh, this is the oldest uh, new town, uh, no, oldest um, housing estates in Hong Kong, uh, 99 blocks, so like a small new town. Uh, this is also private. So both of these are private and you can see the landscaping there. And uh, these are mostly uh, private housing estates, uh, three of these, and this one is uh, public. So again, all this community shopping, uh, uh, entertainment, uh, recreation facilities are found in the uh, lower floors. And then the third study is a, a vertical, uh, uh, I would call it vertical retirement village. So these are uh, independent housing units, and then these are the amenities, and including a, a daycare center and care and attention homes. Okay, now uh, for the first study, which is a citywide study, um, it's really looking at kind of a livability, the kind of livability uh, which are uh, uh, inducive for healthy and active aging. And um, so uh, here are some of the, uh, I mean, take, take out the uh, survey findings from those who are aged from 60 to 74. And uh, what are the most important housing attributes? So the most important to, to this elderly cohort are transportation network. I mean, for them, easy for them to travel. And the traveling cost now is very, very low. It's only Hong Kong dollar, uh, $2 uh, per, uh, per trip. Uh, on the uh, underground railway. And you can see close to shopping centers, uh, sufficient housing space, affordable housing, neighborhood safety, accessible uh, health clinics, surprisingly, it's not as important as uh, going to shopping centers. Um, and actually uh, from the um, study there, we found the accessibility to facilities and services, in fact, are regarded as uh, most uh, important. And 89% um, of the elderly prefer to age in place. Then what, to them, what are the critical factors? So you can see all the way access, uh, accessible you know, for everything, uh, uh, medical services and uh, recreation facilities, uh, uh, home modification. So it's kind of internal accessibility. So a low income people's um, uh, um, hope for or, or interest in accessibility, in fact, are not as high as the higher income, uh, possibly uh, because uh, in public housing estates, in fact, they are better catered for. And I'll show you examples of this later. Now, so this is the aspiration, but what then are the actual situation? The actual situation from the study, we find that um, only 41% they are served by suitable recreation facilities, and only 29% uh, live near to community, and actually only 5% find that they have adequate provision of easily accessible elderly care and services. So, so that means that, I mean, in the city-wide level, uh, there's quite a, a big gap between what people aspire, what people want, from what they actually can get. Um, and then also, um, the kind of desirable environment, so again, uh, they find that elderly centers good because they are important providers of social activities and services. Uh, accessibility to uh, recreation facilities is important. Again, uh, this, uh, because this can facilitate uh, social activities. But so this is what they want to have. But the actual situation, again, if you look at the percentage there, uh, all are pretty, uh, <clears throat> pretty low, actually. Okay, but then when we turn into a housing estate situation, uh, the, the, um, the living environment is much more 
elderly twenty. So uh, the public housing estates, as I said, is uh, more actually desirable. Uh, they, they have better uh, livability performance because actually public housing in Hong Kong uh, is about half of the people, 50% of people live in public housing, either rental or owner occupier housing. And the Housing Authority has uh, this kind of uh, planning and design principle. So you can see that all of them here, they are, uh, they are they are good. They are uh, uh, um, uh, they they really fit kind of a healthy and active aging for the older adults, All right? So comfort, convenience, barrier-free accessibility, and good connectivity, and all that. Now for private housing, uh, we don't have such a requirement uh, except the general planning standards and guidelines. So this is why actually. Uh, Elderly people living in public housing, they're better off than those who live in uh, uh, private housing. Now, this shows the kind of facilities that uh, the housing estates have. Uh, the uh, column in this color, they are public rental housing. This is uh, subsidized general housing, also provided by the government. And then these are private housing. So these are rather basic facilities. So for all types of facility, uh, housing estates tend to have these facilities. But when it goes to the higher order kind of recreation facilities, you'll find that most of them are uh, supplied in the private housing estates, but less so in the public housing, much less so actually. But are they happy? Generally, from my uh, uh, survey results, uh, even those in public housing, they, 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 they are happy with what they've got. And I'll talk about that a bit more later. Okay, now look at the accessibility to community facilities and services. Uh, overall, actually, says accessibility are good or are very good. So people are happy with what they've got. Uh, you can see that these are the blue in color, blue color. Uh, these are shopping centers or shopping centers. And then these are covered walkway, covered walkway. All right. So, uh, and so all these, the, these are housing blocks. They're all uh, quite well connected with the uh, shopping centers, which have uh, multiple of, uh, facilities, and they're quite centrally located too. And um, and then, now this is in public rental and subsidized uh, uh, owner occupied housing estates. So again, uh, they have all sorts of uh, sort of installation to enable uh, a more walkable uh, neighborhood environment. And then, uh, but now, even though, yes, there's a, such a planning concept there, but uh, from my study, uh, actually it also depends on local situ local environment. Uh, this uh, housing estate is built on a on steep slope. Uh, you can see that sometimes even disabled people will have to walk up. And even there are lifts that take people from uh, lower floors to higher floors of recreation or community facilities. Um, sometimes, I mean, at uh, peak hour, there's long waiting time. So um, if they, they, they walk, then they have to use staircases. And you may remember, I just showed you the, uh, the uh, to natural topography of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a very hilly city. So, so inevitably, some of the housing estates, they have to be built on the steep slopes. Um, in actually private housing estates, they are not so well uh, provided, particularly in the older uh, housing estates where people have to walk up the, uh, the steps. And, um, and then uh, here they, they have foot bridges, which links, across, uh, links up uh, the shopping center with some of the buildings. But these uh, foot bridges, they only have staircases you know, for people to walk up to. You know, they, they, they don't have lifts to take people up to the, uh, the foot bridges. And then again, it's in the public housing that the housing estates are connected with um, by uh, 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 footbridges with the neighboring housing estates. As, and as you can see from the photos here, actually the walkways they are you know, often and the footbridges they are covered as well, and they're served by uh, by lifts. Um, so public transport. Um, Hong Kong is a city of public transport. So 90% of the 
travel trips are by public transport. And uh, that is because, uh, I, uh, because of the high concentration of people in a small spatial scale. Uh, and thus it makes uh, public transport to be profitable. So uh, public transport here uh, in Hong Kong is provided by private companies and they are guaranteed a profit rate of 14% uh, by the government. And uh, this is the railway station, so only two to uh, 12 minutes. And so that actually makes it easier for the elderly to travel around. And so they don't necessarily have to stay in their own housing estates. Now, coming to the uh, sense of safety, uh, in most of the uh, housing blocks, um, well, actually in almost now all the housing blocks, public or private, there's always a security guard uh, on the ground floor of uh, the housing blocks. Uh, and the guards would travel a petrol around their states as well. And with that, then in this survey among these housing um, estates, uh, we find that actually most people uh, feel safe in the housing estates. If you look at this, uh, people who are uh, age um, um, less than 60, 93% feel that they feel that they're safe. Even for the elderly people, people who are over 60, they feel safe as well, you know, 88%. And of course, those uh, private estate gated, um, they, uh, the sense of safety is very high, even among the elderly. So three color are the elderly, those are uh, over 60. Um, uh, but across different age groups, you can see that actually, uh, and across different housing estates, the sense of safety is quite strong. Uh, less so, slightly less so in public rental housing, but still 84%, which is still a very uh, positive response. Now about the neighbor, now this comes to their social interaction. Um, whether they feel, feel safe, if they feel safe, of course, that will be good to their mental and psychological uh, well-being as well. Uh, so do you trust your neighbor? Overall, very pretty good percentage, high percentage as well. Um, and uh, for the um, uh, the older adults, uh, slightly lower, but still is a pretty high percentage as well. Um, and then uh, in terms of the um, uh, facilities, um, the active and the passive social space, now, these are the slides that I took from the public housing estate. And um, so these are elderly people. They like to sit around and chit chat. And this is the covered walkway leading from the uh, railway station to uh, um, the, uh, the housing blocks. So uh, very often, I've got elderly people sitting around here, sometimes bringing their grandchildren. Uh, and so people, when they you know, are coming home from work, they actually would say hello to one another and they chit chat and all that. So it's a pretty sort of uh, good kind of a social environment. Um, not as good as in, um, I mean, the sense of uh, actually, sorry, here uh, is the sense of uh, community. Uh, it's not strong, not so strong in new and gated estates. I mean, as you can understand. Uh, when people don't uh, know, don't, uh, doesn't have not get to know well uh, their, their neighbors. And somehow gated communities, um, they, they, are, they are rather, they're perhaps more self-sufficient. They feel very safe, but their social interaction are not as strong as in the public housing estates uh, like, like this. And uh, that again is another picture. Uh, the, the pictures that I show, and um, uh, uh, this is in the public sort of open uh, park, but these are really gathering uh, places uh, in the housing estates. So uh, they, they seem to uh, quite enjoy this. And now uh, the, uh, in terms of public realm, now this is more or less, more or less the um, identity shaping uh, features, uh, and some of social space. Uh, so generally, they are better designed in newer public rental housing estates. Then this one is one of the oldest housing estates in Hong Kong. Uh, people just gather together, bring their own chair and sit uh, underneath the flyover. So again, that, that demonstrates actually um, you know, sometimes you know, public rental housing, if they're new, that their public space is better than those in the older 
uh, private housing and place, which are well, quite expensive places for the middle income people. So more examples about the landmarks, uh, shaping the sense of identity. Uh, um, now, okay, so so that was the situation. So from, from our survey, we find that actually, uh, now taking pride in the estates, uh, obviously not very strong in subsidized housing estates, uh, higher in the high price uh, areas, uh, but the sense of belonging actually is quite high uh, overall, about 87% and even higher among the elderly people. Uh, lowest in permanent rental housing, open estates, but although they're lower, but, but the sense of belonging, I mean, if you look at these uh, uh, numbers, they're still uh, very, very good. And uh, subsidized rental, 92%. And um, okay, do they like living in their estates? Again, overall, very positive response. Uh, but um, do they participate in the uh, housing uh, estate management? They don't really. Uh, but I think in, in some ways, uh, they're not, not lack of participation in some ways is a good thing because usually uh, re residents get together when there are problems, uh, when they have concerns. So, um, and, uh, but homeless uh, management actually um, is the um, following the British uh, model uh, has been, uh, I think, among the, uh, the best in uh, Asia. Okay, so now about late neighborliness. Um, so overall, when I asked them, do you think residents mutually help one another? Uh, well, they said, yeah, well, nearly 79% uh, or 80% say that yes, uh, people will mutually help one another. But actually the most common interaction is not so much uh, giving mutual help, very little. It's more just saying you know, greeting to one another. Uh, but even that, then there seems to be overall, you know, a, a very positive response uh, about uh, whether they're satisfied with their. Uh, and uh, we find that um, um, the sense of uh, belonging of the elderly people is higher if they uh, have been um, living in that place for a longer period, and if there are uh, favorable accessibility to recreation facilities. Uh, and again, uh, residential uh, satisfaction uh, is again linked to link, um, uh, link of residence and uh, walkability, accessibility. Uh, sense of security, again, also linked to favorable uh, accessibility to recreation uh, facilities particularly. So overall, you can see that the length of residence and accessibility, in fact, uh, accounts for um, the, uh, the 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 um, the, um, the the mental well-being or the uh, social psychological well-being of the elderly. So in that, I think the planning and design actually uh, would have actually have a significant influence on the elderly's uh, uh, well-being. So finally, let me just uh, show you about this. Um, 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 vertical retirement village. Uh, so all the recreation facilities are here. So purpose hall, hobby room, uh, game room and all that actually in the same block of building here. Um, even dining room and all this. I, I know uh, some of the residents very well and I've been visiting, I can visit their, their units. And of course it's universal design. Uh, We'll see in the housing units and on the corridor as well. And then now, but I think what, what is most important um, in this particular project is, is good accessibility to shopping centers. Uh, now, so this is the, uh, <clears throat> the retirement village, uh, Jolly Place. And all these are uh, shopping bags. So denoting uh, uh, shopping centers and shops here. So you can see that there are a, um, a lot, uh, quite a few shopping centers here. So this is a housing estate. So these are housing blocks and there's shopping center and there's another housing estate and uh, you know, shopping centers, another one. And actually there are some of them, uh, this is the railway station. And then actually these shopping malls, they are interconnected, linked all linked up. 
And what is important is in this um, uh, retirement village here, uh, it's, um, it's on level ground, on level ground. So this is the, the block here, all right? This is the, um, the elderly uh, residential home. The block is here, and then next to it, this is the um, um, medical center all around here. And actually this here at the back there will be the shopping malls. And then on this side, other shopping malls. And, uh, and then across the road, this is the garden. At the back of the garden, in fact, are hospitals. So, so, so the, um, the residents there, they, they can go in and out and I can see a lot of wheelchair users uh, moving around uh, in, in the area. Uh, in my uh, focus group the discussion with them, they, they are very happy, actually. And actually, the NGO who is running this operation, uh, they are running in a deficit because they underestimate how a conducive living environment actually lengthen the lifespan of the people. So then that means the turnover rate uh, is lower than what they expect. But to the contrary, this one is called cheerful court. And the people that I talk to are less, less uh, cheerful than those in Jolly Place uh, because now, if you look at this environment here, this is uh, cheerful courts. Now, one shopping center, and then there's another one. But people are unhappy, are unhappy because going from where they live to the shopping centers actually is difficult because there is a long staircase that they have to walk up. Now, uh, this is, doesn't show very clearly. Uh, it's actually the buildings at the back here and, and then they have to walk down uh, a, a flight of stair, stairs in order to go to this shopping center. And so this is on one um, exit from, the, uh, the, from this um, uh, cheerful court there. But on the other side, the other exit of this uh, uh, vertical retirement village is actually just across the road. Then there are various retaining walls. And it's above the wall that there's another housing, sort of housing estates. And there's nothing on this side. So that means and there's nothing on this side to see or for them to can be used as recreation space. Uh, on the other side, yes, shops that they can go around, but, but actually there are accessibility problems. Uh, the last one here is, uh, this is for the um, higher high income groups. Um, but this is not in a very not in a very good neighborhood, so very narrow um, entrance actually to this uh, compound here. So um, this is uh, this the sort of three um, projects. I mean, some of the findings I would like to share with you. And and here I I, I really want to raise a few questions, uh, which is about the role of urban planning and design in building an elderly livable environment. So the question is, urban form, does it matter? Uh, decentralization or centralization or urban sprawl? Which one would be, would be, able, would, uh, be able to provide a better living environment for the elderly? And at the neighborhood uh, level, so um, neighborhood accessibility to goods. Now, does uh, residential development intensity matter? Uh, the higher the in in intensity, in the case of Hong Kong, uh, that would mean that there's um, um, an economy of scale, more clientele, with a, a, I mean a larger clientele, with a larger clientele, then uh, there could be more community facilities can be supported. But of course, when there's uh, more intensive housing development, uh, higher blocks and all that, then there would be uh, the uh, concern for um, overcrowdedness. So it's a matter of how we really manage the, uh, the density. So, so um, uh, in the neighborhood uh, accessibility issues, of course, the accessibility to home care and healthcare uh, services is important. So how does this kind of, in, how does the, uh, how, how do, does the uh, home care and healthcare intensity link up was the residential development in, uh, intensity. I think it's something that uh, planners and designers uh, would uh, need to think about. Um, 
So uh, what kind of living environment that can actually deter physical and cognitive degeneration? Now, not, not necessarily high density and definitely not the kind of high density and high rise that Hong Kong has, but, but how, 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 how do we define it? Um, a, a livable environment at the local level that can actually uh, reduce uh, cognitive uh, decline or physical ability decline. So the questions, overall question is, do population density and development intensity matter? Does it matter in every, every city or, or not? And say building form, does it matter? How, how much does it matter? Uh, high rises, low rises, single browse housing estates. Um, and then um, neighborhoods, what kind would be better? Spontaneous or planned neighborhood? Uh, spontaneous, we have the, the beauty of, uh, it's sort of organically developed and perhaps more acceptable to the, uh, to the local people. So again, I think there is um, um, a kind of a housing culture there that, um, that, that again, there will be a diversity. And so with that kind of questions uh, at the, uh, in my mind, then I'm trying to sort of reflect on the Hong Kong's case. Uh, it seems that com compactness can promote cognitive reserve because it enables higher density of community facilities and services, uh, easy integration, easy integration with the local community because they would shopping malls actually it won't just serve the housing estate itself. It will draw people from outside of the estate to go to the shopping mall. So then there's will be more interaction. So there will be a more sort of mixed community. But I think accessibility to all these facilities and services still depends on uh, the site environment. Uh, if housing estates are built on, the, on slopes, then accessibility could still be a problem, particularly for the wheelchair uh, users. Um, and um, say larger housing estates, they seem to provide more opportunities uh, and enable uh, uh, more comprehensive uh, neighborhood design, uh, particularly I think for public space. But the drawbacks of Hong Kong's housing estates, housing blocks tend to be monotonous and it could be con con uh, confusing to uh, residents with cognitive impairment and uh, there are generally uh, limited space for physical activities. Uh, and then of course, um, housing estates, we start to build housing estates in the late 50s. So there are many of the housing estates are in fact old uh, estates. And again, I try to illustrate that in old housing estates, actually there's inadequate, inadequate facilities and, uh, and services. So that means, well, there's a lot that Hong Kong uh, need to do. So maybe uh, recommendations would be, um, say maybe the use of administrative uh, planning tools such as the planning centers and guidelines or statutory planning tools, uh, so, such as those uh, which are uh, shown as comprehensive development areas. So these are usually big housing estates. Then, uh, then the government can mandate a planning brief uh, to uh, enhance the neighborhood accessibility which is found to be uh, most important uh, for the uh, well-being uh, of the uh, of a livable env environment conducive for the well-being of the elderly people. Uh, and then I actually have suggested to the government and has uh, accepted, uh, because Hong Kong has so many housing estates, all right, 70% of the people here live in housing estates, and 50% of people living in subsidized housing estates. So actually we use the housing estates as the, um, the hub for the provision of elderly services. And that has been adopted by, um, by the uh, biggest elderly housing provider in Hong Kong uh, in their uh, medium uh, development strategy and actually has been adopted by the government has been implemented all over Hong Kong. Um, and, but, that, but that is uh, only up to subsidized housing estates because the government controls the can, is the user and also the owner of the, the land. But for private housing, uh, government lease out the land. So they're not the um, user anymore. But I, I suppose they should put down uh, uh, pres prescriptions there to um, mandate uh, developers uh, to provide 
more and better public space and uh, and uh, make the sort of more accessible uh, environment for the elders. So I think that's all that I prepared to uh, share with you today. Uh, this is just the major uh, references. So uh, a bit over time. So uh, sorry, uh, Nick. Uh, so any comments and uh, questions will be most welcome. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you very much uh, for sharing your research with us today. Thank you very much also for the very detailed case studies. Maybe it could be uh, good to uh, stop sharing your screen so we can we can see you a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. That's possible. Yeah. Um, so there are questions. I'm going to I'm going to take questions in a moment, and I'm also going to read some of the questions that we have. I um, I like particularly uh, the naming of some of the estates. You mentioned cheerful court and uh, <laughs> jolly place. Uh, I mean, my opening question was going to be, is there somebody we can write to in Hong Kong with suggestions? Because I was jotting some down here. Uh, oh, yes. Who oh, names yeah. these places? Oh. <laughs> well, it's uh, Hong Kong Housing Society. Yeah. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the Housing, Hong Kong Housing Society is an NGO. Um, uh, the uh, I think the longest established um, housing provider is like housing association uh, mm. in the in the UK, and they are the forerunners in the providing purpose design uh, elderly housing. Okay, so. we do have some serious questions as well. So I'm going to start with one from uh, Professor Yvonne Ryden, and she asks. Has Hong Kong experimented with multi-generational buildings, say combining nurseries with restaurants, cafes on the ground floor, but with housing for the elderly above? The idea is that this makes elderly residents feel more integrated into the urban society. Into urban society. So, you know, the question generally is: um, you showed us a picture of a, uh, a sort of vertical community, uh, vertical village for elderly residents. But are there any that are that intentionally bring together uh, different groups? Yes, uh, actually, Hong Kong Housing Society has experimented on that, partially based on my recommendation because this five thousand big uh, survey study was actually done for them. Uh, but it just doesn't seem to work very well. So the idea is uh, to have uh, all the occupied housing uh, in the upper floors and the uh, lower floors their rental housing for the elderly. And then of course, then there will be shops and facilities and all that. But it doesn't seem to work uh, very well. Uh, the idea was to actually, uh, to, for the same family, I mean, two um, sort of intergeneral, intergenerational families. So it's the children living up in the upper floors and the elderly in the lower floors. So that's our links. Um, links uh, was a, a uh, residents doesn't quite work. But what, what works is in a housing estate, in the for normal families, uh, housing society have got say two or three blocks, which are for the elderly only. So although these elderly people, they are not uh, the parents of those who live in the normal housing blocks, but still that creates a kind of mixed um, community. Uh, it seems to work quite well. Uh, okay. I'll take another question. We have a question from Emily New. Uh, I know Hong Kong has a regulation to maintain a lot of green uh, spaces in the city. What do you think about the association between uh, elderly well-being and green spaces? This is a very interesting question, actually. Um, uh, we actually have been doing some other studies with um, other teams. Um, we, we actually find that um, in terms of uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, um, greenery uh, actually uh, doesn't help. Uh, I, I think it's because of the lack of stimulation. Uh, in terms of mental well-being, particularly cognitive function, I, we, I, I think it's, uh, you need a more stimulating environment. And there's too many greenery, particularly what I call, call as a passive greenery. So people can just look at it. And very often, now in public housing estates, 30% has to be uh, covered by, by greenery. And once they're covered, they, they cannot be used. They actually 
um, they're actually there at the expense of social space. Okay. So, okay. so I come up with a term of active greenery. Active greenery would work very well. So there's another another study showing that actually when people can actually uh, do say community farming together, they see the plants growing and plants actually have life, and the elderly would then get some kind of interaction with the with the uh, the greenery. Then that's different. That actually okay. will have a positive impact on the uh, mental well-being. So like allotments as well, uh, allotment gardens, for example. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, uh, a question now from uh, Claudio de Magalais. Uh, you suggest that mandating public space from housing developers might be a solution. How would you make sure that this space retains its quality over the years and that it is not then fenced off by one section of residents? Um, I think again, it goes back to um, property management or housing management, which is very important. And how the housing managers would make use of those greenery to, as I said, to make it active, active greenery. So to actually involve the, um, the, the residents to, um, to, to in, in the actually looking after the plants or even ask them to put their plants there. And actually that becomes a kind of, a, I think very useful social space. And as I said, I actually, I. I had, had uh, recently found uh, about 40 plants on my rooftop and then seeing them grow, flowers coming suddenly come out and drop and then come back again and all that. That actually um, is a kind of interaction with something which is alive. So, so I think the idea is uh, um, professional housing management plus turning the greenery, the green space into active uh, greening. So community, Farming, I think that's because of course there aren't many private gardens in Hong Kong. Not many private gardens, but no, but no. it would be a luxury in Hong Kong. Yeah, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay, I have a question from uh, Sam Davis. Rebecca, you mentioned that length of residence is a positively associated with sense of well of uh, belonging, residential satisfaction, sense of security, etc. Is there any evidence that residents' well-being is negatively impacted by significant change around them in their neighbourhood in the form of new developments and so forth? Um, I have not uh, done specific research on that. And uh, new development around, around housing estates or older housing estates, it really depends on what kind of new development it is. Say, if you open some more shops, uh, more entertainment uh, facilities, then of course it will be a good thing. Um, Hong Kong is, is it, the Hong Kong's built environment is very compact uh, because only 24% of the land in Hong Kong is developed. So a lot of people squeeze into this 24%. So the neighbor, the actually um, housing estates, they are not isolated. Yeah. Uh, even though they're gated communities, it could be gated. gating is only for people going in and out, but it doesn't mean there's a gating for people to uh, use facilities outside the housing estates or for outsiders to use the shopping facilities within the housing estates. Because shopping facilities, uh, uh, the, the, the shop owners, of course, and then the uh, developers, they would design it in such a way that these shops can still be open to outsiders in order to increase the volume of uh, business. So, so the simple question is, I mean, simple answer is, uh, uh, it's a matter of what are the new buildings for, you know, uh, new developments are for you know, surrounding those older housing estates. Great, we've got a, a few questions, a few more questions coming in. Uh, I'm struggling to keep up with them. Um, just one thing that I wanted to ask actually, uh, Hong Kong has a very particular urban form. Uh, you showed some pictures and, you know, clearly it's, uh, it's very unlike London uh, and very mm -hmm. unlike uh, the rest of the UK. Um, however, and you've, you've speculated also uh, at, the, at, the, at the close about the impact of density and the impact of uh, densification and urban form. Um, can you draw out any uh, generic principles? I mean, we've, we've talked about active green space and clearly that could be a generic principle that could be public or private. But is there anything else uh, from your case studies that you could you would highlight as um, you know good practice for planning uh, in dealing with active age in addressing active aging? 
that, that is transferable to different contexts? I think, uh, again, um, we would have to look into what affects uh, mental well-being. I mean, like in the case of Alzheimer's disease, clearly stimulation is important mm -hmm. for people to keep uh, alert, uh, keep their minds going. So I think then there's a principle for planning and design where we, would, we should make an interactive and interesting and accessible um, environment. Okay. And actually about the, um, I mean, how, how high density, how high, I mean, how, how intensive uh, development, how intensive should development be? Uh, what is the kind of population density or building density which is uh, uh, the best? I, I, I would like to uh, quote actually Yvonne Ryden's uh, earlier writing. Uh, it's not the number that's important. Is 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 the whether we have enough people to support um, as um, a reasonable, reasonably wide range of community facilities for people to to, to meet their needs and to make the place a uh, uh, vital and vibrant. Okay, great, thanks. I have a question now from uh, Yuet Young. Uh, the social housing, particularly the public rental housing, is much stigmatized in Hong Kong such as presence of poor income families, uh, violence, uh, gangs, etc. What is your view on the ways in achieving social cohesion and instilling a sense of belonging uh, to residents that are faced with those sorts of challenges? Um, I don't quite agree that uh, public housing in Hong Kong has a stigma. Yes, indeed, there's a lower income people. Uh, but in terms of the, um, well, if I call a housing estate as a neighborhood, in terms of the neighborhood design, actually they are better than many of the private, old private housing estates uh, for the middle income group. Because housing is so expensive in Hong Kong, those who can afford to buy a private housing, they, they cannot buy a big home. And usually uh, the public space are, are more limited uh, because they are maybe not as, as poor. And, um, and then also the, because I was a housing authority member for 14 years, I can see the architects, their aim is not to make money because public housing, I mean, it's, it, it's unlike private housing, right? What your boss wants is you know, a higher profit rate. But in public housing, then uh, architects can really um, use their professional knowledge, experience, whatever, to uh, maximize um, the uh, quality of the uh, housing estates as a way of satisfying their professional uh, dream. So actually, they, they're better designed than, than others. Now, yes, their um, crime rate is higher, but, but because, again, of housing management, crime rates in Hong Kong is low. And that owes very much to the housing estates uh, kind of uh, being the dominant housing forms in Hong Kong. Because when there's a housing estate, then there will be always uh, very good security control. So, uh, yeah, I think my right. so answer uh, Another question from Yvonne Ryden. Uh, the results that you've shown focus on the over 60s, uh, we think. Uh, would you think, do you think the results would be affected by splitting the 60 plus age group into different cohorts? So you analyze the the young, old, and the yes. medium, old, and the old, old. Yes, yes, it's, it's very, yes, very good suggestion. Uh, um, that's one thing I, I, I may mean to do. Uh, and in fact, we have all those figures, but just to, um, I mean, to, it's hard to go into the details of this big study. Uh, yes, we are very much uh, aware of different age groups. Uh, they have different uh, uh, responses. I've got a question from Andrew. Uh, this is uh, relating to something that's happening in London. Hackney Council has recently started a public consultation on a child-friendly uh, supplementary planning guidance. Do you think a focus on improving the built environment for the young would have a detrimental impact on the elderly? So do you think that their, their interests are uh, separate or different? Uh... The interest could be separate, but actually I remember when I stayed with my grandmother years and years ago, one thing she really was delighted to see 
for their children. And actually elderly would like to watch children play you know, in the playground. And actually uh, in some of the house, in, in many of the housing estates, what happened was either it's the parents or grandparents, uh, they'll bring the children to the playground. And so the children will play with the, the neighbor's children, whereas the parents will talk to one another. So, yeah. so in fact, it's the different age groups. I think they would have, um, if you would want a kind of more harmonious sort of a housing uh, compound or neighborhood, I think it would be good to have uh, uh, recreation facilities uh, or for different age groups to, to be put you know, sort of close to one another. Yeah, I think that goes back to uh, Yvonne's question right at the beginning when she was talking about um, these intergenerational buildings. And I, and I think if, if I understood you correctly, you, you didn't think that was a good idea, but, but it is a good idea to promote these interactions between different generations. Yes, it was not a good idea in, the, in, in our experiment uh, uh, because we are expecting uh, uh, elderly parents and their younger children who stay in the same compound, but in different floors. So that didn't quite work out. But those who are not related, I mean, the elderly and the, 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 um, the younger ad adults, uh, not related, but living in the same place. That 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 is okay. fine. That that works out well. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick out two more questions for you, Rebecca. So yes. <laughs> then your grilling is over. Um, uh -huh. uh, the question from Angela Vincent is: um, This sounds a lot like co-housing. Uh, are there any co-housing communities in Hong Kong? Uh, co-housing, in fact, is in in our culture in our culture that yeah. uh, parents live with the uh, children and children will only move down if they are married. Uh, and uh, in the public housing um, estates in Hong Kong, public housing estates in Hong Kong, actually uh, there is encouragement of um, not co-housing in, um, in one housing unit, but in say one housing estate. So in fact, if they are going to move their their parents, uh, elderly parents, either together in one housing estate, uh, one housing unit, or uh, in the same estate but in different blocks, they have priority for allocation. Okay. And uh, I'm about to finish off one paper on looking into co residence based on my uh, large uh, study. So. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna now, now gonna roll two questions into one. Yeah. So that I don't break yes. my rule. I've got a question from, uh, from Wang. Uh, is the scale of buildings relative to the sidewalk beneath them one issue in promoting uh, mental wellness in Hong Kong? I'm not sure if you, if you understand the uh, question. Not understand? quite, can you repeat that? Yeah, is the scale, is the scale of buildings relative to the yeah. sidewalk, so that the massing of the buildings relative to the, to the, to the sidewalks, and I mean, if you, you know Hong Kong, you walk down the street, you're on the sidewalk, up above you, you can just see a slither of sky uh, because of the scale of the building. Oh, Does that it's not, melt of mental well-being? I, I don't think so. It's not uh, proportional. It, the sidewalk, the, the width of the sidewalk is not... So so we cannot have this kind of sunshade, uh, no room, you know, that sunshading cannot cover say, half of the building next to, 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 to it. We, we cannot afford it because the buildings are so tall. <laughs> yeah. Then that will be very uh, the uh, buildings will still be very much apart. But so this is this is part part and parcel of life in Hong Kong. The the, the scale of things, the massing of things, um, yes. it's something that people are, are are familiar with and 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 cultured to, I suppose. Yeah. Could I just add one point? Actually, uh, housing space standards per person is the lowest in Hong Kong among. I mean, the lowest. Uh, Hong Kong's housing space per person is the lowest among um, developed uh, economy. 16.7 square meter per person. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, well, finally, finally, why is residential satisfaction higher amongst women? <laughs> I, I think it could be um, they, um, they stay home more. 
and uh, and I think it could be because of convenience. I can imagine when you just walk downstairs, then the shops is next to you, right? I mean, housing estates we have big shopping malls in housing estates, and yeah. uh, this could be three housing estates linked together, so three shopping malls linked together, uh, and different orders of goods. So that means you, you don't run out of uh, kind of a, you know window shopping or actual shopping, uh, iron food and all that. I think I think perhaps because men usually they don't have to you know, they don't care so much about shopping they don't have to take care of that, but women would have to and then the children going to school and all that I think that possibly yeah I think it's a very good I'm question. Commenting on specific specifics of Hong Kong culture because I love shopping. Okay, so you'll be happy coming to stay in Hong Kong. <laughs> well, I love online shopping, actually. Uh, uh -huh, yeah. Rebecca, thank you very much again for sharing your research with us today. Um, were we in a lecture theatre now, you would you would be hearing applause like this, yeah? So thank you, thank you. You have to imagine it. Um, for the audience, everybody out there, and for, and for you as well, Rebecca, um, yeah. we've, uh, in the chat, we've put a link to, uh, our uh, public lecture events for the remainder of the year. So uh, hopefully, uh, because you don't have to fly all the way to London, <laughs> uh, you might decide to join us uh, yeah, at I should. public lectures. We'll certainly invite you. Thank you Thank again. You. And, Thank uh, you for your, for your invitation. To, uh, Thank you. look forward to catching up with you and seeing you in person as soon yeah. as possible. Yeah, in Hong Kong. See you later, uh, next year. Great. Okay, Thank you very bye. Much. Thank, thank you. you for listening and thank you for your invitation, Nate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you for all the uh, the, the, the comments. Thank you very much.